Hello and welcome to this coach education webinar on with high performance director uh, Ruth Doctor. Ruth, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I suppose to just get started. Um, what is your role entail of a high performance director? Can you describe it for people? Yes, of course, Gareth. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, I oversee and I and, and supervise three areas: so international football. Uh, the under eights international teams and the women's teams, and Stephen obviously is responsible for the men's senior team. Coach education uh, means maximizing the potential of the coaches, Ireland's best coaches, not only the best, every coach, every standard. Play development and how can we maximize the potential of uh, Ireland's elite players. Okay, uh, you mentioned Stephen there, Stephen Kenny, he's come in now as the Republic of Ireland senior manager. Um, Stephen also has another role um, as well, and I suppose one of the things Stephen's described as his new role is that he brings a football voice to um, the director level. Yeah, that's that's correct, and Stephen has has clarified that in the media himself. Uh, I very much welcome that because it's important to have football table on uh, football people on the table at the table, and Stephen has a strong voice and opinion. He's very much uh, thinking uh, in the bigger picture of Irish football, so it's great to have him at, at that executive table. Rude, you've been with the FEI a few years now. Can you talk about the developments of international football, both the men and the women's side? Yes, so the ultimate goal is to maximise the potential of Ireland's elite players uh, to produce uh, players for the, for the international teams, both men and women. And that's a, responsible, a responsibility for each manager. So, yes, the individual team is important, of course, but it's more about seeing the bigger picture of developing players from the Emergent Talent Program all the way to the senior team, men and women. And we want to be seen as, as one team with one vision, with one goal. Um, and ultimately, we want to be able to compete with the best teams in Europe at Andre's level given the best uh, opportunities to develop. Um, therefore, we have uh, upgraded our programs. We've looked at the international, international benchmark and uh, we want to play more international matches. We want to uh, play the better countries as also that guarantees better learning. So not afraid of, of losing matches. It's great to play Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, France, because that provides so much learning. Um, and we have developed a common playing style based on a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-3-1 with variations, attacking, possession-based style, uh, competitive, creative and intelligent decision makings. So that is all being discussed in the weekly managers meetings we have. Um, the managers of the men meet weekly and so do the uh, managers of the women's teams. And we discuss the teams, each manager uh, presents on the matches they have played. They, they, we discuss the, the, uh, the players. We discuss the developments at, at the elite level, uh, the trends. We bring in foreign managers to discuss and share experience and knowledges. So it's all about play development. And I think at this time, and I'm talking now for the man's side, we can see the fruits of the work some great results at under age level, as we all know, with the 17s and the 19s. But more importantly, we see so many young players coming through. And uh, it, it's great to see what happens on that side. Um, and, and I believe strongly that that's a result of the collaboration and a consistent approach for a number of years in the elite player pathway. Yeah, you, you can definitely see um, the development happening there. Um, one of the things, um, to, to touch on Stephen again, uh, in relation to this, he, he, he came out with a quote recently saying that he wants the men's senior team um, to play in a style that school kids around the country will want to aspire to. That's a really encouraging and inspiring thing to say, isn't it? It is. It's a, it's a fantastic ambition. And it's absolutely doable and possible. And I believe both the men and the women's senior teams should always be a huge inspiration for everyone in football. And that's where the nation comes together and a common playing style is becomes then a huge identity for everyone. Is, uh, without harboring too much on the men's side of things, on the women's side, you know, what, what are the steps that have been taken there to kind of progress uh, the development? 
Yes, well, in, in 2017, um, there was an appointment uh, for the first time to, uh, to, an appoint, to appoint a full-time uh, manager for the women's senior team for the first time. Uh, Colin Bell came in. Uh, we did well in, in the qualifying campaign with European champion uh, Netherlands and also Norway. Tough. We did very well. Um, and now Fira has come in, uh, replaced Colin, and we are on track to hopefully qualify for the first time ever for the European finals. That would be uh, fantastic. We see young players progressing to the senior team. Our underage international teams that have uh, consistently performed by reaching to the elite status in European football should not be underestimated. Uh, we have the home-based training sessions in Evanstown, which is an addition, additional training sessions for the talented players. However, it's just once a month and we encourage the players to have extra training sessions with boys because the standard in Europe in the top leagues of women's football is, is training sessions between four, six, seven a week. So we need ultimately to achieve that, that standard as well. Um, for the development in, of women's football in the broader context, we need to work hard on improving the conditions of, uh, for women to play football to ensure women have equal opportunities to play the game. And therefore, we need to enhance the number of female players. So more players means also having more talented players, but also means we have more leagues, better leagues, more competitive leagues. Um, and I think also mixed gender football would play a significant role in the development because it provides so much opportunities and advantages for girls, but also for boys as well. And I think we need to focus on that really for the, for the coming years. Um, and as you know, it is also, I think, the success, it clarifies the success of, uh, of the Netherlands. Mixed gender football was already on the agenda since the 90s, and Fira would have played a significant role in that. She was actually the driver of that. And I think uh, having that structure in place uh, brought the Netherlands to where they are now. Then we need also to improve the elite player pathway. We have the women's under 17 now in place, very successful. Um, but we're also there's gaps in, on the 15s and the 19s side, so we have to look at that. Um, then again, we need to enhance the number of female coaches. We have identified the challenges of female coaches and encounter on the coaching pathway. So one of the initiatives from that was to have a women's only UEFA B course. And the second one is now running. And we will probably also host a UEFA C license for, um, for women only. So that's a good development. And then... Last, I would say we need also professional structures at the top of women's football. Developments in other countries have shown that professional men's club have embraced a women's department. And it would be fantastic to see the same thing happening in Ireland, that the League of Ireland clubs embrace a women's department. Sounds, sounds promising. Um, I suppose a lot of that kind of leads into creating a culture. And it's, it's something that... You often speak about through the in terms of creating a high performance culture. What what do you mean about when you say that? Yeah, it's it's not it's not a mystery. It's not magical. Um, high performance, in short, is about the best players, the best coaches, the best programs, the best structures, the best environment, uh, the best behaviors, and it's it's all about creating the right environment based on attitudes, uh, motivation, learning, attributes. Be the best you can be, uh, be accountable, and not ever accepting mediocrity. How do you how do you apply that to grassroots level then, for example, and and, and to leagues as well? Yeah, high performance is is not about money. As I said, it's not mit, uh, magical. It's not a mystery. It's it, it it can be applied to to all clubs. There's always a culture. You end up with what you have, but. A high performance culture can be introduced at every level in terms of what are your values, what are your beliefs, what are your common goals, what, are you, what is your coaching philosophy, what is your style of play, what are your support systems look like, are you all working off the same hymn sheet, is everybody, is there, is there one vision, is there one team? So yes, it, it is not easy to implement, but if you focus on it, it can be done at every level. 
it's just been there's been a lot of work done at that um grassroots level, hasn't there, in terms of the establishment of the Emerging Talent Programme, the Girls Centre of Excellence as well, and um, the National Academy. Yeah, absolutely. And and the Emerging Talent Programmes are very, very important. Um, it's it's critical to play a development in Ireland. And uh, the identify of the, the aim of that programme is to identify, monitor, um, develop and evaluate players in the ace from, from 11 to 15. It provides talented players with the opportunity to train within their own local area. They don't need to travel for uh, a long time, but it's an additional training session with quality coaching. And also it provides us the opportunity to um, yeah, to have to identify the best players and also to make them ready for the national teams. And it's it's a very important program. It's also on the board side, it, it is a safety net for those players that don't make it to the national league. And I suppose part of that is that they're getting high quality coaching and there's been a lot of changes in the coach education system in the last couple of years as well, hasn't there? Uh, absolutely, and, and that's rightly so because it, it needs to evolve every year. You need to, to raise the standards constantly. And the ultimate focus in coach education is, is to, to improve the quality of the coaches that work at the various level uh, of the game because uh, coaches work with players. And uh, yeah, better players means a better standard of football. And in order to have better coaches, we need also to look at the quality of the coach educators. So that requires top quality coach educators. And and I'm very proud uh, to see how the department has dramatically improved in the recent years under the leadership of Nilo Regan and his staff. And there's a very dedicated and passionate staff. Our content is in line with UEFA modern principles and learning, and there's consistency, continuity in, in vision and delivery. And we are, we are uh, offering courses at every possible level. Not every country is allowed to do so from UEFA because you have to meet the minimum criteria, requirements. And, and uh, we are delivering free women's only UEFA B courses. Uh, we are delivering uh, player education programs from the League of Ireland clubs for the 15s, 17s, 19s. Our pro license course has just been uh, finished. Really, really good standard. I can say that because I have a good idea what's happening around Europe. And our next pro license has just started under the new COVID-19 restrictions and, and we, have, we have found new ways of learning with introducing an, e, an uh, online e-learning platform. So uh, looks all good. And you, you kind of alluded there, you, you have a bit of an inside track because you're part of the Joyra panel. What, what, what is that and, and what's your role in it? Um, yeah, the, the, the Jira panel, uh, which is named after the Czech player uh, and coach Fakhlek Jira, is a group of football and coach educators experts. And uh, the main aim is to improve the, uh, the quality of coach education in all UEFA member associations. And ultimately, of course, to develop better coaches, better players and, and better quality of the game overall. And my role and the role of each Jira panel member is, um, yeah, we all have a supporting and advisory duty and also a role as evaluator to, uh, to the members' associations to see if they all still meet the minimum requirements. So I would have uh, three, four countries I would, I would evaluate every three years. And also Ireland is, is evaluated, not by me, of course, uh, and to see if, if we're all on track. Um, so you're getting a good chance to look at what other federations do around Europe. Where, where would Ireland rank? I appreciate that you don't do it yourself, but where would we rank and where would we compare, compare to with other nations? Well, there's, there's no ranking system in place because all countries um, are different. It's hard to compare them all because they, they, they are different in terms of size, different in terms of numbers of players, men, women. Um, infrastructures are different, so all they face different experiences. But every three years, as I said, there's an evaluation uh, by UEFA, and ours has always been very extremely positive. And so that's an indication. And 
also I mentioned before, not all the countries are allowed to deliver all UEFA courses because you have to meet for each course the minimum requirements, and that's what we do. So I'm talking about minimum requirements for the content, for the coach educators, the hours, the facilities, etc. Um, just to rewind a little bit back to, to kind of grassroots, um, a number of years ago, you helped launch the player development plan. Um, how, how has that gone? It seems to be quite a success uh, since it's been implemented around the country. And like, how does it actually affect younger players as well? The plan is, is all about play development and uh, players enjoying football. And the plan is for girls and boys. And we must ensure as adults working in football that all players have the opportunity to play the game, to learn the game and to enjoy the game and to develop to their maximum potential. Sounds more easy than it is. And, and the core, the foundation of the plan is, is based on two principles and two very important principles. And the first one is a common uniform player-centered philosophy for underage football, which is based on enjoyment and skill development, whilst reducing the emphasis on winning. And I'll explain that later. Uh, the second one would be a uniform and age-specific playing model based on continuity and consistency, a gradual buildup from 4v4 to 5v5 to 7v7, uh, nine a side, and then to 11v11, the full game. Um, that's basically the foundation of that. And I suppose the foundation is really important, isn't it? Because um, you're, this is the start of the building block of the development of younger players. Yes, there is now there is now clarity and uniformity, consistency in the leagues. But first and foremost, the individual player has been put into the center of the development, and each player should now always play in a safe and encouraging learning environment, which is so important that they are that they feel free to express themselves. And we know from research that players who enjoy themselves are more motivated. They train harder, they work harder, they perform better, they have more confidence, and ultimately they stay longer in the game. And that's that's what we all want. However, that's unfortunately not always the case as winning has become so important. And winning is the aim of the game, don't get me wrong, but whilst understanding that, um, that children are competitive, uh, naturally competitive, we also must understand the difference between development uh, versus simply winning matches. And uh, winning at all costs inhibits play development as there is too much pressure. And also from research, we know that in a high pressurized environment, uh, about 80% of the statements during communication with players are negative. So 80% of the comments in that high pressure environment are negative. And you can imagine this is extremely harmful to the development of children. And also we know from research that the biggest reasons the brain, the brain's creative power diminishes as it grows up appears to be that adults constantly judge, criticize and disapprove of children. And, and this is pretty serious because this can cause emotional blockage. And when this happens, a child can no longer use its potential. It will lead to a sense of failure and frustration. Children have the right to make mistakes, and it's only then when they really learn. So, what, so what's the role of the coach in, 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 the, in that process? It's absolutely essential. It is a specialized skill to work with young people. So I'm glad that now in our coaching pathway, we have specific courses for that. And... Coaches are not just coaches, they are actually a facilitator, a teacher, an educator, and a role model. In the broader sense, broader context, you might say everyone that works with children is a teacher, full stop. And that brings different responsibilities to the table. Um, you have to understand the various age categories. So the characteristics of a 10 year old, 12, 14, 16, 18 are completely different. The task of the coach is to facilitate the players to help them to play, learn, and enjoy the game. That's difficult enough, believe me. 
So coaches need, players need coaches with a positive mindset who are able to provide that, that safe learning environment. Players uh, need to have the freedom of, of expressing themselves, as I said before, but also coaches need to be able to, to motivate players, to build that self-confidence. Let them make their own decision. Constantly dictating and instructing is undermining play development. It's it's been a couple of years now since the player development plan was first introduced. Um, there are there plans to kind of kind of evaluate it and see and see how how it's going and what maybe needs to be upgraded. Yeah, well, coming back to to the to the uh, observations we've seen so far, mm. there's definitely a more positive and comfortable, attractive environment for children to play the game in. We see a more relaxed atmosphere from all involved with non-trophy football and from 8 to 12. We see players are attempting to play through the thirds and therefore they are getting more challenged in communication of communicating with each other, with the opposition. They are challenged in taking better decisions and, and also to execute their decisions. We also see more positive coaching from the sideline, although that's an ongoing area of attention. And as I said, they need to be free the players of the constant pressure of winning. And yeah, an issue might be the size of the goals uh, used in the 9v9 game. Uh, One of our principles is to create goal scores and the 9v9 correct size goals would facilitate probably that better. So we will look at that as well. And yes, we will will do research now. The, The plan is now five years in action. So it is time to review all aspects of the game. Of the, of the plan. And at the same time, it's a great opportunity to meet the, the players, the parents, the clubs, the leagues. So we will do a comprehensive research. And, and based on outcomes, we, um, we might do adjustments where needed. Okay. From the player development plan, as, as boys and girls come through that, uh, if, if they happen to be particularly talented and particularly um, special players, they may end up going into the emerging talent programs and you kind of touched on it before, but that's kind of nearly the next step up for the, the higher level of players, isn't it? The emerging talent program you spoke yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the first step on the career of a young player who wants to progress on that elite pathway. And as I said before, it is, it is, uh, it's in a in, in very important program because it allows young children to play at in, in a more structured and, and in quality environment in a local area. You don't need to travel for that. And uh, that, that program goes from the regional blocks to the center of excellence to the National Academy. And ultimately, the National Academy uh, goes into the national under 15s or under 14s for the boys. So there's a real pathway now from the age of 11 all the way up to the top. And that's great to see. And, and the Emerging Talent Program has dramatically or significantly um, changed and, and evolved under the leadership of, of uh, Nile Harrison and, and Dave Connell. And, and how has that pathway worked in terms of the national leagues? Obviously, on the League of Ireland level on the men's side, it's from under 13s, 15s, 17s, 19s. And you mentioned on the women's side, the under 17s league was recently introduced as well. Yeah, well, those leagues are a vital step in the progression of elite players. The focus is, again, not on the individual league to become uh, the winner of the league. Well, players also, of course, want to win that league. That's fine. But coaches need to have to see the bigger picture. It's it's a long-term development. So success is not defined by winning the league, winning a trophy. But it's more about developing talent into the next step. Could be the first team, could be to a foreign league. But the main aim is to develop young players to a higher level. So more challenging competitions, more quality contact time and coaching. And ideally, a young player should be on that pathway for a minimum of six, six, seven years. Um, and it's, it's best practice in other countries where if you've looked at, of course, and where they usually start even earlier than the age of 12. Um, Rude, the, the underage leagues, the League of Ireland, uh, under, under 13s up to under 19s and the Women's National League under 17s, they also provide an opportunity for coaches um, to develop as well, don't they? The underage leagues have not only created a, a platform for elite players, but also a pathway for elite coaches. 
uh, both on the men and the women's side. Um, approximately, if we take those five leagues, nearly 500 job opportunities are created for coaches, assistant coaches, goalkeeper coaches, analysts, fitness coaches, physio, and others. So that that's, that seems to be forgotten sometimes, but that's phen- phenomenal, of course. We've seen some of those coaches move up the levels as well. Like, you know, some some may work at one level and, and continue up, you know, earn coaching qualifications as they go. But sometimes it's important for a coach to maybe kind of specialise in one team and one age group, isn't it? That's a good point, Garrett. Um, it seems that sometimes people think, I want to start with, you know, 13s, men or women, whatever, and then move up through the ranks to the 19s and then progress to the senior team. That's my pathway. But I think coaches have to um, to uh, to understand and also to define what is their own ambition. What do they want to coach at underage level or senior level? Because that is different. And of course, you can progress from underage to the seniors, which is which is absolutely fine, of course. But also, I know many coaches who spend their lifetime working in underage level, either men or women. And they become they have become experts in an under 13 or 15 or 17, 18, whatever age groups, because it is it is it is very specialized and you need time for that. It's not only just one year from the 13s and then one year 15s and move your way up. No, become an expert and really understand what this age group means. I'm not saying you have to spend your whole lifetime in one age group, but at least spend a number of good years and to become an expert and to really understand the age group. Um, we're we're seeing um, in the last number of years, um, very recently, um, a lot of home-based players making our international teams. Um, in in your view, how do we keep progressing that in terms of player development to, of getting elite players through? We need to focus on our our domestic leagues, especially now with Brexit coming in. That means that players cannot move before their 80th. Uh, birthday, and we see uh, home uh, home based players in in our squads. More home based players, uh, I believe, in in Colin O'Brien's and the 17 squad, there was a number of 75 percent. Um, and that that is, if that becomes a trend, I don't know. We have to see that over the years. But um, yeah, before it was more the homegrown players than playing in the UK, of course. So that's a good sign, and I think I strongly believe that our leagues can get stronger and stronger if we keep focusing on, on the academy structures to, to make them better and better. It makes our football as a whole stronger, doesn't it? If we have elite players playing for the League of Ireland clubs all the way through the levels. Uh, definitely, it makes it uh, stronger, not only progressing to, to, uh, to other leagues, but especially for our League of Ireland, for the men's and the women's. So... Um, the academies are the future for Irish football, both on the men and the women's side. Um, a good underage structures, a good academy that would develop strong players for the first team. In, in terms of the high performance structure, um, I know you're doing a lot of work on, on constantly developing and updating that. Um, can you give us a little bit of an insight of, of what you're doing moving forward with it? Yes, um, I've, I've, I've been working on a new high performance strategy plan. Um, well, there's, there's, we've identified some key priorities in there, and, and a few of them are continue to, to be focused on a player centered approach. That means continuing to build alliances uh, across the sectors for the best welfare of the player and creating links between the players, the parents, the League of Ireland, the clubs, facility, science, research, education. Um, we want to create um, new performance structures to facilitate elite player development, build a team of high performance experts. Um, we want to further increase the coaching standards to expand the coach education department, implementing new UEFA courses. We um, want to invest in the best suitable people that can work in, in high performance and, and implement consistency and continuity with implementing a new or implementing a one team, one vision, one goal strategy across the organization. And I suppose for your own personal point of view, what would you like to see achieved within the next kind of 
three to five years within Irish football. To see a proud nation inspired by success of the men's and the women's senior team qualifying qualifying for the major tournaments. Uh, we see many young players progressing to the senior teams, both men and women. Um, hopefully we have the best structures on the men and the women's side in place. We have professional academies that 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 really that players can stay, that they have a platform in Ireland and obviously the best go somewhere else. Um, and then also that that hopefully all strands of Irish football are, are working or collaborating to ensure football remains the biggest sport in Ireland. It's, it seems to be a really exciting period for Irish football with all the stuff that you've touched on with the structures from entry level of player development plan all the way through the lead player pathway and as you say, aspirations for the men's and women's senior teams to qualify for tournaments. It's it, it's quite a positive period, isn't it? Absolutely, it is. And Ireland has a huge potential in, in, in football. And uh, I think if we would maximise that potential, there's a great future ahead, no doubt. That's brilliant. Um, there's some really great stuff in there and uh, it's, it's really encouraging to see the work that's been done, but also, as you outlined as well, the work that's coming down the road as well. Um, uh, just th thanks very much for joining us and, and, and providing the insight. And um, thanks very much to you for watching this webinar. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can leave some comments on social media and make sure to subscribe to FEI TV on YouTube. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gareth.